Okay. Um, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Rob Huff, um, but that's not important. Um, I wanted to share with you a, um, a video that's been on my heart and my mind quite a while now. Um, I did a fireside for a small group of friends and kind of a Zoom thing and uh, was able to present some information that um, the Lord has revealed to me through a whole bunch of different sources, not only uh, through the best source, his spirit, but also through um, other people who have their mind on these things. Um, a little introduction to who I am, though it's not as important nearly as the, uh, the content I'm about ready to show you. Um, uh, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, live here currently. I'm in a little suburb called Peoria, Arizona, for all those who are familiar, uh, over on the west side of, uh, of Phoenix. Uh, raised and grew, uh, was raised here, grew up here, served a mission in uh, Uruguay, Montevideo, um, and I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But more importantly, um, I'm a follower of my Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I hope this testimony will be pleasing to him. Um, at the end of the day, I'm doing this because I've been instructed to do it um, by him and to learn of him, learn of these things, and then to get it out to as many people as will hear it. Um, so I hope technology uh, cooperates with me today. Um, I'll be breaking this presentation up into several parts, at least two, maybe three. We'll see how it goes. Um, so far, this presentation takes about two, two and a half, sometimes three hours, depending on um, how quick I move through some of this stuff. But it's really important content, you know, at, at least by my estimation, every bit of it is pretty special. So um, I wanted to start, though, um, talking about a little bit of what I've experienced uh, recently. Um, and I think we do a pretty bad job as members of the church not sharing um, when we fall down as opposed to all of the good things we've done, right? Um, during COVID, um, my wife and I would talk about the gap year that we took. Um, we spent a year not being active in the church, um, though we should have. Um, when the prophet was, was exhorting us to focus on home-centered church, we basically did the opposite. Um, we stopped um, being involved in church. Um, but I am a strong, strong believer that all things we experience in life are for our good, and this life is about experience. And so after that time period where we were away from the church, we got to the point, even when I remember a time we were walking down the street on a walk just together, um, and we were talking about what it would be like to leave the church. And I look back on those times and I just kind of shake my head and go, man, what were you thinking? But in my head at the time, I was so convinced that there was nothing that the church could provide me anymore. Um, I, had, I had outgrown it. I had superseded it in my mental, in my thinking. And, 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 and really what I came to realize after all was said and done is that my testimony was in the church and not in my Savior Jesus Christ. I realized that I did not have a personal relationship with him. And yet, there's a process for all of this. Um, I think you'd all agree. And so I even went as far as there's a couple of times in my life where I tempt the Lord. And, and you know, the scripture says, do not tempt the Lord thy God, right? But I, I, I remember kneeling down in prayer as my last effort to say, well, God, if you're really there and you want me to stay in this church, you better give me a sign that I need to stay. And I told him, if you don't, I'm leaving. I've decided. Um, you know, DNC 9 tells us to decide for ourselves and then ask if it's right. I wasn't asking if it was right. I was telling him what I was going to happen. Um, long story short, um, he put in front of me a, a book. Um, called Visions of Glory, that um, is an account of a brother that saw some of the things that are to happen in the last days before our Savior returns, and the preparation that all of us will need to go through to 
be worthy to be participators in that process. And as I started to read that book, all of a sudden that fire that I remember feeling on my mission all of a sudden ignited in a way that I had never felt before. Um, it lit a fire in me so strong that my poor wife, I felt like she got whiplash, that I, I went from complete disinterest to 100% all in. Um, I had gone, I had spent a year doing whatever I wanted to do. And it didn't lead to happiness. In fact, it led to depression. It led to uh, negative thoughts. It led to contention. And I then told the Lord, well, that's a pretty good sign. I spent a week reading this book um, and <laughs> crying tears. That just I, I don't, I've never cried in my whole entire life with spiritual experiences. And yet I was bawling like a baby reading these experiences in the pages of this book not that because i think the book itself is going to do that to everybody but because it's exactly what the lord knew i needed to change my heart and i spent the next several months changing everything changing my habits changing my my thoughts um and had that baptism by fire experience that the scriptures talk about where the lord changed my heart well i need to change that or adjust that that phrasing. He gave me a new heart, like Psalm says. It was no longer a. It was no longer, hey, I'm just going to shift a couple of things in you. It was no, we're going to replace this completely. I'm going to rewrite everything. I'm going to reorder your life for the better. And as I submitted to His will and allowed Him to do that, everything changed. Everything changed. Happiness, joy. All of these things that we always go after, um, whether in the church or outside of the church, all of a sudden were just right there in front of me. I was, things I had struggled with my entire life were taken from me by complete miracles. Um, and it's all because I put my faith in the atonement. I started praying with intent and praying with meditation. Uh, involved with that. And, and as I did that, my relationship with my Savior and with my Heavenly Father grew to levels that I'd never expected them to go. Um, one of the direct results amongst many of those things, and maybe in a future video, I'll talk about some of the things that happened because of the shift in my my thinking and my, my willingness to put everything on the altar of sacrifice for God and say, all right, I did it by myself and it didn't work out. Now it's time to let you take the wheel. Um, and, and as I did that, I started to receive answers, um, and direction. And one of those things was to study the second coming. Um, I grew up in a household, um, with my dad, um, who was, a scriptorian is the right word to say it. He loves the scriptures, seminary teacher, institute teacher, institute teacher for many years, and taught us growing up about um, Jesus Christ and his second coming. And so I had a baseline of knowledge, but as I was reading this book, Visions of Glory, things were being unlocked to me that I hadn't considered. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I looked at the second coming with hope as opposed to, I'll never be ready for it. How could I ever be ready for the second coming if, 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 if I'm supposed to be one of the righteous and faithful? It was a as I studied it before as a kid, it was more of a just disappointment in myself as opposed to seeing the potential for growth and using and the second coming becoming a process of consecration for all of us. And so as I studied the second coming, all of a sudden that fire just grew and grew and grew. And the only thing I could think about, the only thing I could study was scriptures relating to the second coming and so i focused on those things i went through all the old testament and realized that isaiah is about the most amazing spiritual gangster anybody will you know that, that that's out that's out there um jeremiah ezekiel malachi everybody talks about the second coming in these last days and that's just the old testament then you get in the new testament and and i realized it's chock full of it. We've, we've got Matthew 24, which is a spectacular chapter of our Savior talking about the things to expect for his second coming. 
and then and then we get into the doctrine and covenants which over half of it i realized more than that talks about what to expect and how to prepare for the second coming and then the book of mormon just what a book um once I got through a lot of these these things, and especially the words of our Savior in Third Nephi, you know, starting in chapter 19 and moving on, as he talks about what to expect in the last days, he then commands us to go back and read Isaiah. So I started looking for as much information, content, um, commentary, and I realized that because of my work and the way my schedule is working out, I couldn't study in the most traditional way where I could set apart an hour and I can open my scriptures and I could read it like I used to, but I had an hour on the way to work and I had an hour back and the Lord blessed me and taught me with ways that I was able to at the time. And, and that what resulted from that was audiobooks and YouTube videos. And I look, looking back, it's a carefully or orchestrated breadcrumbs of information that the Lord put in front of me through the sources of YouTube and these audiobooks that I kept finding. Um, and as I went down this path, I came across several brethren that, that changed my thinking and changed a lot of things. One of those was uh, Farrell and Rhonda Pickering. Um, if you guys ever hear this, thank you so much for all the work you've done. A lot of the work that they've done is reflected in, in this presentation today, and you'll, you'll see that. Um, with new stuff. I hope they, if one day they see it, I hope they can appreciate the layers, electrical, extra layers of information. The, the other um, big source of information that was a major eye opener for me was um, the work of Michael B. Rush and especially the start, um, his kind of first book, The Remnant, Remnant Shall Return. Um, shoot, I got through all of them and I read all, all of them. And uh, I think I've absorbed as much material from, from Brother Rush and also Brother Pickering uh, as much as they have out there. Um, and so I, 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 I mentioned them because they've been inspirations to me. Um, there's also an amazing community out there. Um, if you're looking for a community of people who are, who are looking to the second coming, um, there are many great people out there that um, are having spectacular experiences as the Lord is preparing all of us in individual ways uh, for his coming. So um, with no further ado, I think it's, uh, it's good to jump into this presentation. I want you to know that I love the Lord and I love my Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I have that testimony, um, not because I've been in the church my whole life. I feel like my, my experience with my Savior has really just started. Um, it's been since 2001 that in August that uh, I had this awakening or rather this kind of shocking me back into life. Um, and through that experience, um, so many amazing and powerful miracles have happened in my life. And so I want to share with you one of those. Um, this presentation I put together is a collection of information that um, as I started to study this information, I kept a Google Doc and just started dumping information. And the thing turned into a 60-page document that was just like so much. I couldn't hold it all in my head at the same time. And so um, I, I studied architecture um, in school, and I'm an architect. And so, of course, I have, to, I have to make order out of chaos, right? That's essentially what buildings are. It's a whole bunch of parts and pieces and there's some order out of it, right? Um, and so that's what I did. I, I created an architecture and a framework to basically hold all the information that I gathered uh, into one piece. And so what I'm gonna share with you today is a, um, is a hopefully a clear presentation of that information. And uh, of course, if there's anything that is not in accordance and not in alignment uh, with the scriptures and, and with the prophets, of the restoration of the prophets of old, um, I defer to them. Um, I in no way and uh, am a prophet and, and do not want to lead people astray. Um, stick close to your scriptures and go and study these things for yourself. If I show anything to you today that you haven't heard before and makes you go, oh, I've never heard that. I don't know about that. I've had that many times. I've had that experience with many people. Um, go and study the scriptures. President Nelson has exhorted us to 
study the gathering of Israel and we will be surprised at what is there. And uh, so this is a presentation of my effort to study that gathering and the coming of my Savior, Jesus Christ. So um, here we go. So um, this, like I said, as an architect, I try to make order out of chaos. And seemingly when we read Isaiah, when we re read Daniel, when we read all these uh, re book of Revelations, when we do all these scriptures, they, they can appear to be chaotic because they are best viewed in conjunction and in correlation with each other. So I, I realize that the Lord has provided these little snapshots to all these prophets, some more than others. And as you study it across the board in a holistic approach, it starts to paint this beautiful tapestry and this, this puzzle that comes together. Um, and so this presentation today is really focusing on uh, Latter-day Prophecy and looking at Daniel and John's numbers from the book of Revelation. And it creates a framework for understanding the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So many of you out there um, have had this feeling, this uneasiness, this, uh, this sense of urgency um, of, of a call that, uh, that seems to be coming like, something is wrong i feel antsy like i just i just don't feel comfortable in the world anymore um there's this quote that's a uh, beautiful and triumphant zion and so let me get to that in a second here but how many of us have felt uneasy like something is really off in the world this call seems to be hastening what is in our hearts if our hearts are turned to selfishness and power the result is manipulation and war if our hearts are turned to Christ, the result is an increased desire to learn, serve, and align our will to the Father. How many of us feel that something is fundamentally wrong with government, leadership, our society, morals, our communities, and even sometimes our own homes? Before we as people or as an individual can rise to the glorious calling of building the Latter-day Zion, the call of Zion must be heard once again. Every entrant into that holy city will have heard its mighty trolling in their hearts and will make sweeping personal preparations to be worthy of Zion, or Zion will be invisible to them. Um, I think many of you that are probably listening to this um, have felt that before, that, that uh, as you start to study these things and you talk about it with people, people just go, ah, whatever. And you go, what, am I alone? Am I the only person that's like feeling this like antsiness? You're not. You're not. There are so many out there that the Lord is preparing. And that line of making sweeping personal preparation, this is the same thing that President Nelson gave to us in conference last uh, April, I believe, where he talked about overcoming the world and that each of us needs to be able to put everything, even our most favorite sins, on the altar of sacrifice to prepare for that call to go to Zion. And that pre preparation begins within our hearts here in our homes. So as we have these conversations with people, we start to share these things we get excited about. What is the first thing that most people say when someone mentions the second coming? And I can't tell you how many times people have said this, right? No man knoweth the day or the hour. Quote everybody, right? Everybody says that, you know? And if everybody were to finish reading the scriptures, then nobody actually would say this because this right here is completely taken out of context. So in Matthew 24 that I mentioned before, no man knoweth the day or the hour. It specifically says in verse 40, but of that day and hour, no man knoweth. No, not the angels of God in heaven, but my father only. But in 46, in the context of what the Savior is teaching, it says, and what I say unto one, I say unto all men. Watch, therefore, for you know not, you know not at what hour your Lord doth, doth come. And then verse 48, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So our president, you know, our, our, our prophet, President Nelson, not only is teaching us about watching for the second coming, but he has been teaching over and over, and the prophets and the apostles and the leadership of the church is so focused on the second coming so that we can be ready 
as verse 48 says. So that as the Savior says, no man knoweth the day or the hour, we are still to be ready. We are still to watch for it. We are to be looking up for his coming, not just being busy in our daily lives. So Joseph Smith, though, gives an interesting counterpoint to this argument. He says, Christ says, no man knoweth the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Did Christ speak this as a general principle throughout all generations? Oh, no. He spoke in the present tense. No man that was then living knew the day or the hour, but he did not say that there was no man throughout all generations that should not know the day or the hour. No, for this would be in flat contradiction with other scripture. For the prophets says that God will do nothing but what he will reveal unto his servants, the prophets. What a special paragraph there. <laughs> Joseph Smith, I swear, the man hits like a truck. I, I love reading the prophet Joseph Smith. He did not mince words. And so this clearly says to us that every time we think, ah, oh, no man knoweth the day or the hour, we can accept that that is a slough off. The, the scriptures tell us to be prepared and to watch. And Joseph said, Smith said, no, no, Christ was speaking in the present tense. Of course, Christ will um, notify his prophets of his coming and they will warn us. And what do we look to to conference? President Nelson and all of the apostles, they have been speaking massively about the second time. So this charge to us happens over and over and over. Joseph Smith translation of Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always and keep my commandments, that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things which shall come to pass, and stand before the Son of Man when he shall come, clothed in the glory of his Father. Man, I hope I'm there. And then in addition, Mark 13, 3 Nephi chapter 1, DNC 50, DNC 133. All of these gives us the charge to watch and to pray. Watch and be steadfast. Watch and be ready. Awake arise and watch but always be watching which means that you might be wrong sometimes i might be wrong everything i might show you today might completely off base but at least i am following the commandment in the scriptures laid out in so many places to watch at least try and so as you study the scriptures please look to the scriptures and see what they say about the second coming shift the lens that you read the scriptures and look at it through that lens of watching for the day. So in Matthew chapter 1, and again, this is Joseph Smith, Matthew. And, and so in reality, the, the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 1, which is in the Pearl of Great Price at the end, that's actually a retranslation of Matthew 24. <clears throat> if you notice, that's the only New Testament chapter that is in the Pearl of Great Price. And that's for a reason, because it talks completely of the second time. So in verse 38 and 39, our Savior is talking about the parable of the fig trees. And he says, when its branches <clears throat> are yet tender and it begins to put forth leaves, you know that summer is at night. So likewise, mine elect, when they shall see all these things, they shall know that he is not near, even at the doors. So We need to be careful here because we don't want to use 39 as a way to be prideful and go, well, I'm looking for, forward to the second coming and these people aren't, which means that they're not elect. We need to be very careful not to let pride creep into our hearts as we're preparing for these things and as we're sharing these things with other people. Um, so in verse 39, it says, "Ye look and behold the fig trees and ye see them with your eyes and ye say, when they begin to shoot forth and their leaves are yet tender, that summer is now nigh at hand, right? These are signs of things to come. Even so it shall be in that day when they shall see all these things, then shall they know that the hour is nigh. And when it's referring to all these things, it's referring to all of the signs that our Savior taught about in that chapter, Matthew 24, or in Joseph Smith translation, Matthew 1. It's in the Pearl of Great Price. But I particularly like in Luke 21, says, and it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for the signs of his coming of the Son of Man. So as we increase our relationship with our Savior, and the more that we focus on him and come to him, I bear a testimony 
that he will teach us the mysteries that the scriptures lays out about the second coming. There are so many things that are veiled and layered in ways that are designed to unfold to us as we seek after them. They're not obvious. They're not in your face. But as you study them with the spirit, all of a sudden the onion un unpeels and you see the beauty of the tapestry that our Lord weaves into the scriptures. So in verse 40, and they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. Today we're going to talk about some of those signs and, and what we need to look forward to. Okay, so we when we're building a building and we're building a scaffolding and a framework to support all of the systems of our beliefs, we need a set of tools that helps us to understand these things. Um, and one of the things that's really critical to understand in the tool that you can have in your tool bag is the understanding of the Jewish feast days. After all, our Savior was Jewish, was he not? Um, and, and he is Jehovah of the Old Testament. He literally revealed these days to the children of Israel for a purpose. And so it's important that we understand them as well. And as we understand them more, we realize that they point to Jesus Christ and we realize that these days will actually be part of our framework for the second coming. And so I want to do a quick overview of some of these days so that we can understand these. And so um, the Hebrew word for these days, the appointed days or the Jewish feast days are, are moed. And to, to make it plural, the multiples would be moedim, right? The I am adds a plural form to it. Um, but in translating our Bible, the, the key words you need to look for as you're studying the scriptures, you'll see feasts, and but more precisely, they actually mean appointed days, um, times, places, or meanings. So, for example, the Passover, Feast of Trumpets, First Fruits, um, all of these, these different feasts, these are all appointed days, and they're all revealed in Exodus numbers and the specifics of those in the, uh, in the Old Testament. So there's a couple of quotes that I think it's important to call out. Um, Doctrine and Covenants 121 and Genesis 1. Um, these are specifically using those phrases, appointed days, and these times and signs. And so DNC 121, verse 29 to 31, it says, All thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, shall be revealed and set forth upon all who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also, if there be bounds set to the heavens or to the seas, or to the dry land, or to the sun, moon, or stars, all the times of their revolutions, all the appointed days, months, and years, and all the days of their days, months, and years, and all their glories, laws, and set times, shall be revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of time. And so this is a promise from our Lord saying that he's going to reveal all the sequencing, the timing, this perfectly orchestrated grandfather clock that he has established to wrap up all of the dispensations of the fullness of time to prepare us for the seventh dispensation, which is the millennium. All of this will be rolled back and unfolded to us, especially those appointed days. I think it's important that that phrase is in there. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let there be for warnings signs and for appointed times, feasts, seasons, and for days and years. So the Lord is using these appointed days to anchor these key times of the years. And we'll see more of that as we move ahead. So I just wanted those two points to show out, uh, to be evident to you. So the appointed days, if you all understand and know what this is, you know, in the Jewish tradition, this is what's called the menorah. I'm sure you already, you've seen this before, but have you ever realized a symbolic meaning of the fact that there's seven different candlesticks? And there's different types of menorahs that kind of show the larger feasts, but the seven original feasts that were revealed, I think it's significant that there were seven. I don't think. I know it was significant that there were seven. Um, and so why seven? So the number seven is pretty significant in the use of the scriptures. We'll see in all over the scriptures a reference to seven days of the creation. The seventh day of the week is called the Sabbath day because it represented the day that God rested, right? Um, if you'll notice, the seventh dispensation is the day of rest or the millennium. There's 
extreme significance to that. Seven weeks, seven months, seven years, seven times seven is what's called a Shemitah cycle, um, a super Shemitah cycle or a Jubilee. Uh, 70 years is referenced, 70 times seven is referenced, and then 7,000 years, right? The seven dispensations. Um, I think the number seven, when you see it pop up in scripture, we need to immediately have our heads go, okay, pay attention to that. What is he talking about here? So here are the seven feasts. Each one of these candlesticks represents a specific time that the Lord revealed to the children of Israel, starting with Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot, which is Pentecost, um, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. Again, each one of these uh, feasts have a specific Hebrew or a Jewish name uh, assigned to it. For example, the Feast of Trumpets at Rosh Hashanah, uh, the Feast of Atonement is Yom Kippur, uh, so on and on. Each one of these has a specific phrasing, a meaning, and then also the more vernacular kind of let's call it the Gentile approach to these words, right? And these are some of the feasts that we know them of. Everybody's heard of Passover. We hear that. And we, we know the story of Moses and how that all came about. But some of these other feasts are a little bit um, lesser known. And so um, it's important we start to understand these. Now, these things break into two separate seasons. So the first three, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits, are spring feasts that happen in the springtime. Uh, the day of Pentecost, if you recall, uh, the, the day of Pentecost, when all of the uh, men came together and the apostles were there, and the spirit was poured out upon uh, upon the people and people sp spoke in tongues. That event happened exactly on the holiday of Shavuot, Shavuot, which is actually an opportunity for a pilgrimage of all of these Jewish men to come to Jerusalem. And that is why there were so many men that spoke different languages all in the same spot. Hence the reason for the, uh, the, the pouring out of the gift of tongues and gift of interpretations. It was a function of the spirit so that everybody could understand what, what was being said, but was only possible because this was a Jewish feast day that everybody was coming to gather for. So then we have trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. These are things that happen in the fall seasons. Now, there's two scriptures that specifically reference these appointed days and why they're important. Starting in Leviticus 23. It says, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed days of Yahweh that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Now, Daniel 8, chapter, nine, or chapter 8, verse 19 says, and he said, behold, I will make thee known what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. So Daniel is giving us a key word hint here. That the last days, the last wrapping up before our Savior comes, they're going to be anchored on the times appointed or the appointed days. So we need to be very critical. And as we're understanding some of these key dates, do they align and do they line up with these appointed days? So great, uh, great quote. Um, from Marvin J. Rosenthal, there is hardly a theme to which man can give his attention that is loftier or more important that the seven, than the seven feasts of the Lord. Permit it to be said once more, for its importance warrants it. These seven feasts depict the entire redemptive career of the Messiah. Wow. So if we would expect that our Savior and all of his work Perfect, perfectly fulfilled all of the earlier spring feasts. And we know his last week, the Holy Week, was a perfect fulfillment of Passover, of unleavened bread, of first fruits. His resurrection was on first fruits. It's such a beautiful symmetry at how his life and his, resur and, and, and his atonement played out on these Jewish feast days and how he fulfilled these functions. But we would expect that those appointed days would echo throughout all of the establishment of his church, both in the times in Jerusalem and in the restoration. Would we not? Let's take a look. Well, let's start with the Holy Week and see some of those connections. Um, so number one, the triumphal entry. This is one of my favorite things. 
Um, if you recall in the scriptures, when our Savior sends um, uh, one of the servants to go over and get the uh, the colt that he was to ride in on, I always thought, who's the dude that just gave the colt to the guy and said, yeah, sure, take it. Come to find out, that colt was reserved for the high priest. And every time they do the Passover sacrifice, the high priest will go out into the fields, select the offering for Passover, the purest lamb he can find. And then he carries it back from the field and gets onto this colt and he rides it in and shows everybody, everybody gathers at the gates and he shows everybody as he's holding the, the lamb, he comes in and then takes it to the temple for sacrifice. But not this time. This time our savior was both the high priest to perform the sacrifice and the sacrifice. He climbed aboard that aboard that that colt and entered Jerusalem while people waved palm fronts. Um, and we do that today um, with the Hosanna shout when we wave the white handkerchiefs. In similitude of that, that special event. And so this is such a cool thing. Um, in addition, Pesach, also known as Passover at Seder, the Seder dinner, the Passover dinner celebration, Jesus washed the apostles' feet and instituted the sacrament and prepared them for his imminent atonement at that dinner. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane that evening of Passover to spill his blood as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, taking the place of the sacrificial lamb being prepared by the temple high priest for the sac Passover sacrifice. And number four, Jesus was crucified on Passover. And the next day, which is still Passover, now keep in mind these Jewish feasts, they start typically at sundown on one day and they'll end uh, whatever day. they. And some of them are two days, some of them are 10 days, some of them are one day, and they start and end at sundown um, of the day. At the same time, the high priest had just completed his work and says traditionally, it is finished, I thirst. Jesus Christ, when this act was happening by the high priest in the temple, said these exact words as similitude of his sacrifice in the completing of his atonement. I thought that was beautiful. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, shortly after that, this seven-day feast, which is that holy week, the whole seven days, is, is to represent cleansing ourselves for sin. This period begins after Passover and runs seven days. Traditionally, the Jews would remove all yeast from their house and eat only unleavened bread. Christ fulfills this feast in his seven-day Holy Week by providing a way for all of us to be cleansed from sin. So number six, the Feast of First Fruits, which is my personal favorite. Jesus was resurrected on the Jewish feast day First Fruits, which was celebrated by the head farmer coming to the high priest with his arms full of the first harvest of barley, and we'll talk about that here in the future. In the similitude, a similar way, Jesus presented himself to the Father as the first fruits, uh, the first to be resurrected and to be harvested. The Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, and now there's a count. As soon as Passover happens, there's a 50-day count. Um, the, the Jewish people celebrate this holiday, Shavuot also known as the Pilgrimage Festival. We talked about that, how all these people came together. All Jewish males were expected to travel to the temple in Jerusalem and commemorate the giving of the word of God or Torah. This day, the apostles witnessed, witnessed the pouring out of the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus before his ascension. So, we would expect that if these dates happened then, we would expect that, expect that critical historical church events would also happen on these feast days. Um, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Do, do some research. If you're interested in this and how these things overlapped, dive into this. But um, spring of 1820, there's some good research that, that says that March 26th was the day of the first vision. But Joseph Smith received a visitation from two heavenly personages, God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. This was the day of the triumphal entry. What more perfect day 
for the Savior to come back to the world after nearly 2,000 years, well, 18, 1,800 years later, um, and ent enter the world again triumphantly to his servant, Joseph Smith. September 21st, 1823, Joseph Smith received praise and is visited three times during the night by Angel Moroni. This was on Sukkot. Uh, September 22nd, 1823, the next day where Joseph Smith goes to where the gold plates are concealed. Now, if you remember, the holiday, how could it be on two days? Because it starts sundown of the first day. And so the, the September 21st at sundown, when he was praying that night, was that holiday of Sukkot. And the next morning, he goes and goes and is instructed by Angel Moroni, still the same holiday, and that didn't end until sundown of, of September 22nd. So it all fell on that same time period. Um, September 22nd, 1827, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, this is actually the Jewish New Year. The first day of the New Year is kind of a resetting of the calendar. Joseph Smith received the gold plates from Moroni. April 6th, 1830, was Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Joseph Smith restored the organization of the church and is the same day of the atonement on Nisan 14. Beautiful. April 13th, 1836, the 16th of Nisan, Easter Sunday, Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Savior Moses, Elias, and Elijah appeared in the Kirtland Temple to restore the priest keys. And then there's another holiday called Shabbat Nachum, which is a lesser known holiday, but it's the day of consolation. This is the day in 1847 that Mormon settlers first arrive at what becomes Salt Lake City and the home of the LDS Church. Brigham Young predicts only 10 years of peace, and this feast leads to the High Holy Days with the assurance that after much tribulations comes blessings, which I think is an appropriate High Holiday for them to, uh, for this to have happened. So, <clears throat> the feast days, they're important. We get a sense that not only our Savior completed these days, but also in the early restoration of the church, these days were important. So let's look at Daniel's numbers. With those tools, let's start to establish a framework in which we can outline Daniel's numbers. And any time that the scriptures actually present any numbers, we need to take notice because it's pretty rare that the scriptures actually give us specific numbers. There's only in very specific special cases, and most of the time are referencing the last days in one way or the, or the other. The other key to understanding Daniel's prophecies is uh, two verses, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. When we're understanding prophetic appointments, we need to understand that the Lord uses these, these number tricks but they're not tricks that's not the right word but these number sequences where one day a prophetic year is equal to one year and so one week would then be equal seven years and so we're going to use those keys to help us develop an understanding of daniel's prophecy so when we go through daniel um there almost every chapter it, it's just so ch almost every every chapter is chock full of information but again, because I'm a, uh, visually minded and I like to try to make order of the chaos, um, I spent some time trying to figure out a visual graphic to help me understand how these things are to be laid out. And so this is a quick graphic that helps us understand that Daniel's prophecy and his numbers are just right on, perfect to the point. So the first thing I'm going to point out is this upper section. There's two timelines you can see, the shorter one on the top left and then the longer one on the bottom. We're gonna focus first on the top left. So um, when Artaxerxes uh, decreed and allowed the Jews to return home, there was, according to Daniel, a 70 week period. And again, we have to do the 70, we have to do the one times seven. And so if we take the 70 weeks times 70, times seven, we get the 490 years. And so if you look at when Artaxerxes decreed the Jews to go home in 458 BC, we count that all the way out and we count all the way up to 33 AD. Exactly 490 years later, uh, Daniel is prophesying the, the uh, crucifixion and the atonement of our savior, Jesus Christ. Um, in Daniel 9.24, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. This is what our Savior set out to do. 
and to make reconciliation for iniquity, the atonement, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, our Savior Jesus Christ. So he, he provides these two timelines almost as a way to say, see guys, I got this first part right. Now let me show you this next part. So this next timeline is really interesting because he does the, does the same thing. He gives us a 490 year prophecy, but this time he anchors it from the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem from Suleiman in the spring of 1535. Suleiman decreed that the, that the Jews can return and the walls can be rebuilt around the city. This is kind of the start of the repopulation of Jerusalem. So Daniel breaks that out and he says 62 weeks is going to occur. 434, again, 62 times 7, 434 years. That locks us right into the spring of 1969. And that is the year that the reconstruction of Jerusalem begins. So we have Suleiman allowing the walls to be rebuilt for Jerusalem in 35, uh, 1535. And then in 1969, the Jews then begin to reconstruct the this, this city walls again. So we, he, he, he prophesies that time chunk, which is pretty spectacular on its own. But then he gives us this additional seven weeks. Um, and again, this is the 70 week prophecy from Daniel. And so it's actually 490 years. And so 70, seven weeks times seven, four, uh, 49 years, that goes from 1969 plus 49 gets us right onto the fall of 2017. Now, what is so important about 2017? It's already passed. What's the big deal? I didn't see anything happen. There are so many beautiful signs that our Savior has laid out there for us to prepare for this final time frame of preparation between 2017 and the fall of 2024. Um, we're going to talk about the daily sacrifice, what that means, and, and why I believe that that time of preparation is so critical. Um, so... <clears throat> I want to point out to something that happened in 2017, the 23rd of September, 2017, right around the time, you guessed it, a Jewish feast day, Rosh Hashanah. Now, this happens in this exact arrangement every 7,000 years. And remember, we said every time we see the number 7, 70, 700, 7,000, we should perk up and immediately go, whoa, this is important. So this was a sign that was given in the heavens. And the only reason that we know this even happened was using a program called Stellarium. Now, there's a whole bunch of different softwares out there, but this is the one that I like using the most. It's really user-friendly. And you can actually go back to September 23rd, 2017, track it back, and you can see exactly how this all lines out. There are so many great videos out on YouTube. Um, there is a great channel, um, Fire Poppy, um, that uh, great name. Uh, she does a great breakdown of these and not only this, but so many other things surrounding the Virgo sign. So I encourage you to go and look that up. But just a quick um, overview of what this is. Um, Revelations chapter 12 says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. I think it's significant that our Savior um, compared knowing about the second coming and the signs to be revealed then, comparing it to a woman and child, a woman in birth. We know that it's roughly nine months, but we don't really know when the baby's going to be born until the signs start to happen, happen. The labor pains and all the different things that start to happen, a woman water breaking, all these things, it's like, ooh, it's coming, it's close, right? And so it's significant that he compares the signs and looking forward to these, these signs to a woman. And in the constellation Virgo, there's some pretty spectacular things that happen on this day that lines up. Um, if you see a woman clothed with the sun, we have the sun right here over her shoulder, um, washing her with, with light. The moon under her feet is positioned right here underneath her feet. Upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. This is the constellation Leo, but it only has nine stars in it. But when these three planets come into alignment with Regulus, pop, 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 we've got all 12 stars aligned over her head like a crown. Leo being a, the kingly constellation representing crown and, and royalty. So it says then she being with child, uh, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And so 
if you see all these cluster of planets down here, it's actually just one planet. This is Jupiter. Um, nine months previous to this sign being fulfilled, Jupiter comes inside of her womb and just goes and goes into retrograde and just hangs out in her womb and oscillates back and forth. And at the end of nine months, and just like, come on, there's that, there's no such thing as coincidence once it comes to these signs. It sits in her womb and goes into retrograde for nine months. And then on this day, September 23rd, it exits her womb and goes out between her legs and is birthed. Now we know that Jupiter is the kingly planet and often references um, references our Savior Jesus Christ, and so this idea of of the child being birthed by this woman all is is shown September twenty third, twenty seventeen. So there's two occurrences of this sign in that same order, and I think it's significant. You're going, wait a second. I thought you said it happened once every seven thousand years. Yes, that's true. But it happened one other time in just a slightly different arrangement. Uh, the three planets that made up Leo's, the crown on Virgo's head, were in slightly different position, but all there and all fulfilled just shifted slightly. Um, on September 23rd is the sign. September 22nd is the first day of the new year, which is Rosh Hashanah. So 20, September 21st is the end of uh, year 5777. Seven, seven year on the Jewish calendar, and September 20th, Rosh Hashanah begins in the evening. So Rosh Hashanah, this Feast of Trumpets, is happening at the same time that this sign is being presented in the heavens in 2017. Now, there's one other time that this sign appears and locks in all exactly the same time frames, the same Jewish days, all lays out exactly the same. Can you guess what the day was? 1827. Wait a second. Was 1827. Hold on, that sounds familiar. What happened in 1827? Oh, September 22nd, 1827, Joseph Smith, after waiting for four years for the Book of Mormon, receives the plates from the angel Moroni. Okay, that cannot be a coincidence that the same exact sign talking about this woman travailing in birth and the kingdom, Christ, Jupiter, being birthed by the woman representing the church is happening. But in verse 5, if we keep going down, we see an extra level of information, which I think is just beautiful. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Where have we heard the rod of iron, iron rod? Oh, 1 Nephi chapter 11, verse 25. And it came to pass that I beheld that the rod of iron, which my father had seen, was the word of God. How, how beautiful. That the, the sign of Virgo, September 22nd, 1827, announces that the Book of Mormon, or the Word of God, the Rod of Iron, is to come forth to all nations. Such a beautiful sign that was put forth in the heavens, and also was on a pre-appointed Jewish feast day. So we need to be looking forward to those days. Okay, so with that in mind, we have a whole series of numbers. And before I end the video today, um, I want to show you the setup of the framework to kind of get you excited for how we're going to fill that framework in. Um, and so here's a whole set of numbers, 1260 days, 2300, 1290, 1335, 42, three and a half years, seven years tribulation period, one hour of judgment, one, one half hour of silence, all these things that seem to be this like chaos and this noise. And you're like, how do I make sense of any of this? In fact, the Christian world uh, across the board has a pretty good understanding of all of these things, but with revealed sources, with a, a better understanding of the scriptures through modern prophets, we get a pretty awesome framework that starts to unveil, unveil itself. So here's a framework that I set up to help us understand what those days mean and how they're actually aligned and, and how we can use them to kind of lock, lock the main events in and how everything else folds into these events. Now, there's two major events we need to focus on um, because they're kind of the crux of everything. Um, and we actually see them come forth in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, DNC 107, um, Matthew 24, Joseph Smith Matthew, Daniel chapter 9, Mark 13, 
they're all over the place. But as you kind of look at the the a holistic view of all of these things, it locks these events in pretty tightly together. And so for the intent of what we're doing today, I'm locking these two events almost exactly at the same time. So those two events are Adam on Naaman and the abomination of desolation. In fact, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 actually says that Adam on Naaman or Adam coming forth is a direct response to the abomination of desolation. Almost to say, Adam's like, enough, I'm tired of this, I'm taking it back, right? Satan, you've had the world long enough, I'm taking this thing back. And so we, we can anchor everything from these two major events. <clears throat> so Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, gives us that 1290 days can anchor from this these two events back 1290 days. Revelation 11, three gives us that we can anchor forward 1260 days. Daniel 12, 12 gives us a wait for 335 days and you'll be blessed is what it says, which is interesting. And then Daniel in uh, chapter 8, 13 to, thir 13 to 14 gives us a 2300 day time period leading up to the abomination of desolation. So we have this kind of framework that swings off this center point. So if you want to do a deeper dive into each one of these things and why I've arranged them in this way, there's so many of these different pieces that, that fills in here. And so I think it's important to spend some time on this slide, screenshot this, go back, read all these scriptures and see if you agree with the way that I've laid this out. Um, now, Adam and Diamon. This was one of those events as I was growing up, as I heard about it, that really stressed me out um, because the phrase we use all the time, everybody that's righteous and faithful will be at Adam and Diamon. And then my internal dialogue was, well, that's not going to be you. You're certainly not one of the righteous and faithful. Um, you know, that was the shame speaking that uh, I think uh, we, we too readily listen to in our minds, rather than the voice of our Savior, we listen to uh, Satan, his minions, um, much more. Um, but as I studied and learned more about Adam and Adam, and I realized that this is going to be an awesome, spectacular time. Um, Daniel clearly describes these events, and then also in Doctrine and Covenants 29, you can see 88, 116, 27, there's all these beautiful references to what is going to be happening around the time period of Adam Naomi. Um, and uh, thanks to Farrell Pickering and the work that he's done, we can arrange and align the events of Adam and Naomi squarely with the events of the first fruits. And some of those, I'll, I'm going to read just one of the verses. So take your time going through all of these sections because I think it's important that you don't just listen to me or anybody else, but you also study these things for yourself. So I want to read DNC 88, um, verse 96 to 98. Now it says, and the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened and be caught up to meet him. Now quickening, if you go on your keyword search of that, quickening is a direct reference to translation. Um and so verse 97, and they who have slept in their graves shall come forth. And so he's talking about the alive people are going to be translated, and those who are in the graves are going to be resurrected. Um, for their graves shall be open, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. They are Christ, the first fruits. They who shall descend with him first, and they who are in the earth and in their graves, who are first caught up to meet him. And all of this by the voice of the sounding of the trump of the angel of God. Now, I love that it specifically references they are Christ, the first fruits. Again, this reference to Christ being the first fruit, the first resurrection when he fulfilled this. And when he returns again, he's going to be coming forth with all of those who would follow him. All those who have passed away to this point um, are going to be resurrected and come with him. And those who are still alive on the earth are going to be quickened and translated for this spectacular meeting at Adam and Um, And so we have this kind of coming down of heaven and this rising up of earth to meet at the center point to a terrestrial condition, if you will. Um, that's this beautiful moment that anchors us into first fruits and Adam and Adam and being that critical point. And so that's really important that we, correlate Adam and Naaman with 
first fruits and the symbolism there. So we have got Adam and Diamond right in the middle, right? We have this seven year tribulation period of 2,550 uh, 2, days, which is totaled by, by adding 1290 and 1260 together. The scriptures talks about this time of tribulation and then the great tribulation, the wrath and the woes. And then we also have the 2300 days that pushes out to a date from the abomination of desolation, which is the daily sacrifice. But then there's this question mark, and it almost breaks up all of these happenings that Daniel laid out to us, not in two periods of three and a half, or two periods of, of that make up seven, but it almost starts to set up a framework of three sections, or two overlapping sections. So we're going to talk about that here, and I'm going to end the video with that kind of teaser. But the questions that come up my, into my mind is, okay, there's all these other things that have been talked about. The, the American Civil War that Joseph Smith prophesied about, when does that happen? When is the Antichrist coming to the scene? Like, where, his, where is his role? What is he supposed to be doing and when? Um, when are the saints gathered out of the tribulation? Because they're, it's clearly says they're not supposed to be in through the whole entire tribulation. And so... When do we get out of the madness? When is New Jerusalem to be, re uh, be rebuilt? That Third Nephi, um, Third Nephi twenty one talks about, and Ether Ether fourteen talks about. When's this New Jerusalem supposed to be rebuilt? Um, when's the seven year trial for the saints versus the seven for the Jews? Are they the same? Are they different? Has, is there any precedence for the Lord having two separate time periods for the Gentiles and the Jews? Uh, yeah, it's all over the scriptures. And so if we assume that the Lord treats these time periods for the Jews in the house of Judah differently than the time periods for the Gentiles, we can assume that maybe he's going to do it again. So remind you of these sevens. The more we see the sevens, the more we have to pay attention to them, right? So let's look at a possibility of how all of these days could line up. Okay, so if you recall... The 2300 days kicks back to a time period out here. The 1335 pushes out to this. We've got some question marks. What are these things? We have ourselves pretty firmly grounded in Adam and Diamond with the abomination of desolation. That's related to the Antichrist versus Adam and what he's going to be doing. Again, we have opposition in all things at the same time period, which is really interesting. But then as we start to see these overlaps, we start to see that there is a seven-year period for the house of Joseph and the seven-year period for the house of Judah, which I think is really interesting. Um, the Lord said in the scriptures that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And so when the Savior came and taught the Jews, he taught the Jews first and but held back on teaching the Gentiles until his time was complete. And then the time of the Gentiles began in the teaching of them was, uh, was, was brought in by the apostles, and he left the spirit for that work to be done. In the last days, it's going to be the opposite. He's going to flip that. He will first call in his people, the Gentiles, or the house of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, and then he will call in Judah, right? See how he reverses that. Um, but there's precedence for that, right? The Lord, when he, uh, when he was talking to, um, to Jacob, and he had to go after and seek out a wife, he saw Rachel and he loved her and she was amazing. And he, he's like, I'll work seven years for that beauty, right? But we all know he kind of got tricked on that one, right? Worked seven years for Rachel, but then he ended up with Leah first, right? And so that is indicative of what happened first. Judah was the first that he received. And then the seven years work for Rachel. And then in the last days, we flipped that. And so you can see this kind of overlapping that starts to happen. Okay, so... If we look at the amount of days that runs out, seven years for Joseph, and Joseph, that's the Gentiles, us, right? So we use this calendar that's a 365-day calendar. And so if you count seven times 365, that's 2,555 days. So let's track that back from Adam Diamond all the way back. So we got a question mark. What's that? And then the 1290 to 1260 is the 2,550 2, days or seven times 360 days now you're going wait a second why do we go to 360 days now if do some research on this the jewish calendar is set up on a lunar calendar and the gentile or the gregorian calendar is set up on a solar calendar so 365 for the solar calendar and 360 
for the lunar calendar. And so you'll see the five days less, right? So we got some question marks on the front end and the back end. What are, what are these things happening? And then how can we fill in everything else? Um, in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, it says, Alas, for that great, that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, for he shall be saved out of it. Now, this is showing us that there's an opportunity for us to be saved out of the trouble if we are true followers of Jesus Christ. So that's the goal. Okay, so before I end this video, I want to end up talking about these three harvests. Um, now, let me go back here so that we can, we can, we can see. I'm going the wrong way, sorry. We can see we got these three time periods, this, this yellow, this orange, and this red, and it's an overlapping in the middle of the seven years for the Gentiles and then seven years for the Jews. So let's look at the yellow, the orange, and the red. Now, if you recall, the Jewish feast days happened on particular times of the years, and the early two feast days happened um, in the spring, and the first two harvests of the spring is the barley harvest, and then the second one is the wheat harvest. Now, the first fruits um, harvest, that is when the farmers bring the barley to the high priest and he deems it good, right? And so the first harvest to happen is the barley harvest. So it says, the Torah instructs that on the second day of Passover, we should bring the first cutting of our barley harvest to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem as an offering to God and not to partake of that year's barley crop until that offering is made. As the first fruit crop of the harvest, barley speaks loudly throughout scripture as prophetic of not only Yeshua, but of the bride. In many of the prophetic pictures of the bride, barley is either present, present or is associated in some way. Many of the bride examples, as well as bride characteristics, include mention of the word barley in some way. So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 38 to 39, it says the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So you can see the, the harvest is the end of the world. So we're talking about these last days. So these three last harvests. Now, the interesting thing, if you know anything about um, barley and wheat and grapes and how they're harvested, um, barley is an interesting plant because as you pick it, you kind of shake it a little bit and the fruits or the little seeds just fall off. Like it's really easy to harvest it. They gather it together, they shake it a little bit and they drop it off. I think it's very funny. It's not funny. Maybe the Lord just has a good sense of humor that all these earthquakes, the shaking of the world is one of the signs that is going to precede the second coming that the barley is shook in a little bit, right? And so perhaps, it's gospel according to Rob, perhaps that the first major signs of the world is a shaking, light earthquakes scattered throughout the world to start to get us to wake up and prepare for this first harvest. Now, the second harvest is very interesting too. Um, the second major feast of Israel is called Shavuot, or the Feast of Latter First Fruits. Having the Greek name Pentecost, it occurs exactly 50 days after the Feast of Early First Fruits. If you notice, that's the middle, that summer one, right? Uh, this feast occurs as a memorial of the much larger wheat harvest and includes waving of two loaves of leavened bread before Yeshua. Now, I find it particularly interesting that the barley harvest is much smaller and the wheat harvest is much bigger. It's very interesting. Notice that the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdom are broken into three parts. And we're talking about three harvests, a smaller harvest of barley, a larger harvest of wheat, and then a massive harvest of grape to produce the wine for the rest of the year. Indeed, Pentecost portrays the second harvest of souls. Those that were not yet ready to be harvested at the first resurrection since they are leavened and they are thus made to be baked in the oven to go through the furnace of affliction in order to bring the crop to a state of readiness. So we're starting to see two separate groups of people, one who's already ready and a small little shake gets them harvested. And then you go to wheat 
if you ever heard of the phrase ch chaff in the wind, now what you have to do to harvest wheat is they have this surface and they always do it downwind. So they have the wind blowing across the surface and you harvest um, the wheat on the surface, but then you have this second kind of bag area that catches all the chaff. And so you'll smack the wheat and you'll, you'll be a lot more rough and violent with it. You'll smack the wheat and it'll break the seeds off, but the chaff, all the extra stuff, flies off into the wind, right? That's where that phrase comes from. And so there's much more kind of violence and much more uh, tribulation, if you will, associated with this harvest. So now the third harvest, this is the seventh month. This is a fall harvest, the grape harvest. Um, and actually occurs at the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the last of the feast of the year. This harvest is not only occurred by picking, because it's not enough to just pick them. They put them into a big vat and they crush the grapes. They get every last bit of juice out of this. There's a crushing. There's a horrible process. There's a stepping and a stomping that happens. The first harvest is this little shake. The second harvest is a smacking. And the third harvest is this crushing of this. And so if we were to look at this in terms of people, we have three groups of people that are prepared for the coming of the Lord, that need to be shooken and woken up, and a people that needs to be crushed and proven that, that the Lord's day has come. It's great scripture references, bottom right, you can see all those. Go and look them up, spend some time studying these harvests. harvests. But I think it's very significant that as we look at the framework of Daniel's numbers, it becomes apparent that we have these three different time frames that the barley, wheat, and grape harvest starts to be illustrated in the time frame and the time that Daniel has laid out for us. And it becomes this idea of the trial of the saints, a tribulation that really begins for the rest of the world. Um, and it might even be as cookie cutter as members of the Church of Jesus Christ members of the general Christian group as a whole, and then the Jews. Um, the Lord does not want one soul lost. And so all three of these harvest periods are not, oh, these people are worse than these people, and so they just need some more beating to beat it into them. No, the Lord knows these people so well on a, such a personal level that he designs these tribulations to bring them to him and give them every opportunity possible for them to turn their hearts over to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so these days of tribulation are not, day, they're, they're going to be rough, but the scriptures call them the great and dreadful day of the Lord. These days are intended to bring the hearts of the children of men to our Savior, Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile alike. It doesn't matter who you are, all the children of our Heavenly Father upon the earth are going to have the opportunity to accept him or reject him um, through these time periods. So I want to just leave you off on one little nugget, one beautiful little nugget that our good friend, Farrell Pickering, um, he was the man that found this date. Um, he's a numbers guy and he went and looked for 50 years before 50 years in the future, which I thought it was funny. It's like I couldn't find a single date that lined up right to this. 50 years in the future, and I stopped looking after 50 years because after that, I'm going to be dead and someone else can worry about it. And so if that makes sense. 50 years from now, I'll certainly be dead as well. And so um, we looked, you know, he looked at all these 100, 100, 100 years, and, and I was like, all right, well, let's see. I did it myself. Obviously, nothing to this date. The Savior hasn't come yet. And so nothing's going to line up yet. But then I looked, same thing, 50 years in the future, every single year, all the feast days to see if all of these numbers that Daniel gave us lined up to feast days. And there's only one year, one year on first fruits that lines up with Adam and Diamond, that every other single number that Daniel gives us lines up exactly on a Jewish feast day. When I saw that for myself after i heard brother pickering say that i went let's see i spent i spent many hours going through and checking the math checking the days and sure enough every single day that daniel lays out his numbers lines out exactly 
to April 13th, 2031 as first fruits and dun, 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 April 6th, which is a Palm Sunday, 2031. It just so happens, just so happens that the Gregorian calendar and the Jewish feast calendar lines up in a way that the Lord will point to April 6th, 2031 as Palm Sunday, but also a similitude of April 6th, 1830, that the Lord revealed and established his church. I just thought that the, the symmetry of that was just too beautiful. And not only that, not only that, if we count back from Palm Sunday, April 6, 2031, that seven years, that 2,555 days, that seven years of tribulation for the Gentiles, the first two harvests, we land exactly on a day that I think everybody has heard of. And it's just, it's, it's just beautiful. The more I study these things, the more I just get so excited. And I love like DNC 121, like we talked about earlier in this presentation, the Lord's going to reveal his perfectly orchestrated grandfather Clark, clock. And we see this and we go, oh, how did we not see this? And then we see it and we go, oh, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. So that day to end this presentation is the solar eclipse that is going to be happening next year, April 8th, 2024. Um, that solar eclipse, if you recall, there was one in 2017, seven years later in 2024, again, seven, we have to pay attention to that. That was like Joseph in his dream in Egypt, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. That, I believe, is the Lord with his eclipse in the heavens, showing on April 8, 2024, showing us this transition period, that the time of plenty, even though it's been a time of inflation and economic uh, turmoil, there has been more prosperity gained in those years, maybe not for me and your family, but the construction industry, which I'm in as an architect, there has been more building than I've ever seen in my whole entire career. More people are building, and I go, where is all this money coming from? And yet, all this prosperity is happening in preparation for those seven years. Question is, what are we doing with our prosperity? As the Lord blesses us, are we preparing for those seven years of famine that are about ready to come? Now, verse 39 says, And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. This sign, April 8th, 2024, is an eclipse, and we'll talk about that eclipse in the next video, that is the anchor point of the start of the seven years of tribulation for the Gentiles, the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And then there's a shift overlap starting at that 1290 days that Daniel lays out for us that runs out the 1290 plus the 1260, the seven years for the for the Jews. I just love how beautiful that that framework is and lays out for us exactly to the day, exactly the day, not even like, oh, we're pretty close, a couple of days off, so let's go with it. Exactly to the day. I just thought it was beautiful. So I'm going to end this video on this part one. There's going to be a part two coming um, very soon. I, I'm, I'm hoping to do it within a few days as opposed to wait a couple of weeks because this is such cool stuff. And I want you all to see how each one of the numbers Daniel gives us, what day it lines up to exactly, how we line that up to our Gregorian calendar. Um, and then also um, and then also how that lines up to the Jewish feast days. Uh, it's super critical that all of that lines up. And it, like I said, it only happens once. It only happens once, and it's beautiful. So um, I want to end this video and this part, just part one of, of, of looking at Daniel's numbers and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ with my testimony of him. He is coming, brothers and sisters. Uh, he is my Savior. He's my friend. He is my master and my redeemer. And I know that as we look forward to his coming, the Spirit will speak to us in new and unique ways that he's never spoke to us before. 
the more we turn our hearts over to him and serve him in the gathering of Israel through missionary work and through temple work. Double down on everything you are doing at the temple. If you're going once a year, all right, you need to be going more than once a year. If you're going once a month, make it twice a month. If you're going once a week, make it twice a week. The more we do that, the more we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, miracles will happen and we will become a people prepared for Zion in the second coming. I share my testimony of these things in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.